Hello, I'm David Hunt and welcome to The Art Hunter. My guest today, close to 30 years in the theatre management, leads Australia's largest owned and operated theatre company, uh, includes programming, producing programming, um, stakeholders management, show, invest, show investment, they're, they're wonderful on, on that front as well. Uh, and a lifetime in theatre means he really knows the business and, and the people know him in the business as well. The theatres are amazing and one of them is hosting right at this very moment, uh, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Uh, and other theatres are, uh, well that's the Princess Theatre of course, uh, and the Regent Theatre and the Plaza Ballroom there, uh, the Forum Theatre and of course the Comedy Theatre. Jason Mariner, hello and welcome to The Art Hunter. G'day David, thank you. That's a very nice introduction. Uh, what an amazing job you have. You're mm. like, do you almost wake up every morning and go, oh my God, I've got so much to do, but wow, what, what a job. Yeah, do you know what? I do now and um, I just feel incredibly privileged uh, to have the opportunity that I have and uh, because I came to uh, the, the uh, career in the theatre almost by happenstance. Um, uh, I grew up in the country and, uh, and I don't have a musical nor uh, uh, an actor's bone in my body. It's really not my forte. But that, that's a good thing in a way, don't you think? It is. You know, like not to, you know, like in the position you're in, it appreciates the, the theatre, but don't want to be, oh, I want to be on stage being part of that. Exactly. I, I think that's been enormously beneficial because I don't ever look and think that should be me, that could have been me, I wish that was me. I actually would have done a better job. <laughs> yeah, than that. <laughs> I, I can sit back and say that's just extraordinary yeah. and admire the talent because it's not mine. And I also too appreciate the role that we have to, um, you know, bring the, the talent, the production, the audience together and that enormous role that we have to play and we can play and a lot of people play mm. um, backstage. Mm. And you must on an opening night or, or the, the last night of a production, where the crowds are loving it, they're applauding, you know, like the, the cast have, have had so much fun. You, uh, must, you must sit there and go, mm, here I am in this spectacular theatre and, you know, like, look at it. This, this is magic. Theatre is magic. Theatre is magic. You just said it then. It's, um, it's, it's such a beautiful medium and, uh, and I do. I remember uh, particularly one afternoon uh, when we had Mamma Mia had just um, had opened at the Princess Theatre and had been playing for months and it was just literally sold, after, sold out performance after sold out performance after sold out performance. And you look and you say, where, where does everybody come from? Where, you know, what, why, peop, why do people take the time out of their day and buy a ticket and come to sit in a theatre? But quite literally, I remember watching Mamma Mia, um, just the audiences flow out and they're uh, their almost their personalities and everything was that there was a sense of elation as they floated out of the theatre. You walk in with everyday uh, worries and concerns and you can float out mm. and start the week mm. uh, or month afresh. Mm. And I thought then you can really see that transformational, uh, you know, the aspect that theatre can provide mm. music, musicals and art. Yeah. Uh, the other wonderful side of what, what you do, apart from some of the most spectacular shows that your theatres have staged over the years, is just the theatres themselves, Jason. You know, like they're so beautiful. And you've, you do so much work on renovating, you know, like for Harry Potter to, to arrive at the Princess Theatre. You closed it down. To yeah, we did. We did. It's very much built into the uh, theatre and the Princess Theatre was just made for Harry Potter. It's just uh, the, you, you couldn't imagine, a the, you, could imag you could not imagine a theatre more suited to the world of Hogwarts and, yeah. um, and the mystical, magical world of Harry Potter. Uh, but there was, a, there was um, we closed for practically nine months to both renovate um, and also to then to build uh, the production into the theatre. Yeah. Uh, but the results have, have been worth it. The show has been fantastic. And, mm. uh, but you're right. Uh, uh, 
it's you know that I guess that's what you know drew me into you know continue really the legacy um, of the theatres that we have in Melbourne that my parents uh, worked to uh, invest in and restore when it was really very much a um, you know a, a dart at a dart board it was a, mm. a, a you know a, a lottery ticket yeah um, because Melbourne had and has such beautiful theatres but they'd been neglected for a long period of time and mm. were ultimately when we first bought the Princess Theatre in 1986 were uh, practically uh, derelict. Mm. So it's been a long, long journey both to invest in the buildings, uh, to bring, I mean now you can't imagine the Princess Theatre not just being forever and a day, being a, arguably one of Melbourne's most important buildings, mm. but mm. you know it was only 30 years ago it was nobody yeah. knew what to do with it. And and the, the reason you had to um, also close it down was because you had to you know renovate to keep it up to standards, didn't you? Yeah, very much. So. Like the old theatres are vi like musical instruments. They they vibrate. They have mm. a, you know, the princess is built on Oregon um, beams. It's literally a timber building, mm. and it resonates mm. with um, vibrates with the um, with the sounds and the audiences yeah. and. Um, and but you know they are old this the new princess theater which is there now was originally built in 1886 uh, so they're very much like old ships they take mm. a lot of um there's a lot of upkeep every yeah. every yeah. day <laughs> and, and i also love it uh, for when it opened with harry is that the carpet uh, tell our, our our viewers what 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 have you done on the carpet? Is there a, an initial or something? Yeah, yeah. I wonder how many people noticed the level of detail. But uh, on the carpet, there's a, a H, uh, which is uh, inscribed into the uh, specially woven carpets, which were designed by the the uh, scenic designer. Mm. Um, but the light fittings have changed. The um, you know on the exterior of the building, there's dra I think. I think there's eight different dragons. Um, you know, every one of those little details has mm. been designed into mm. the building, which just enhances the experience of mm. Harry Potter. Mm. And then we go down to Collins Street, and um, the Regent Theatre is just spectacular. Well, that was laying in ruins. Uh, I, I can remember um, going. I, I was used to work for record companies. I was there with um, one of our artists. We were filming there, and there were pigeons flying in inside the building because we they wanted a you know like a rundown theatre, and this was a run totally rundown theatre. It was completely. My first memory of the Regent was the opening night party of uh, for the Phantom of the Opera, which had opened in the Princess Theatre in I think it, uh, in 1990 yep. and the Regent was the perfect place for the uh, the party afterwards because it was a derelict <laughs> theatre complete within the ballroom underneath which was flooded because remember the city square had That's a right. water wall yep, yep. and the water wall was yep. uh, uh, famously faulty and the um, ballroom was often flooded so um, it was a very apt setting for the Phantom Party. But subsequently, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Cameron McIntosh and my father were there and, and um, the government of the day, Jeff Kennett, and, uh, and the union movement were very, very important in uh, the Regent. Mm. And all those parties came back together after 26 years Whoa. to uh, of essentially 1970, they had a fire sale where everything was basically of any value was stripped and it sat idle for 26 years and then reopened in 1996 uh, with a gala concert and then subsequently Andrew Lloyd Webber's uh, Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, yeah. And just recently uh, finished, um, but it's coming back next year, is Moulin Rouge. And my God, that theatre is beautiful anyway. When you walked into that, the theatre was just spectacular for it, wasn't it? it was. And it was coming out of lockdown. It was. It helps that uh, Global Creatures, the um, producer, is an Australian company. Um, uh, Carmen Pavlovich and Jerry Ryan, very um, uh, entrepreneurial, but they also too had a vision for how the production from the very beginning would fit into the Regent Theatre where it was always going to open. So mm. it just looks spectacular. And as I was saying, you know, the theatre gods really smiled upon us because that was the perfect you could not imagine a more perfect production to bring a city that had been in hibernation for near on two years mm. back to life mm. and like i was just saying with mamma mia people came in mm. with a degree of anxiety and reservation about getting back into amongst crowds and to going out and 
and quite literally floated out of the or mm. danced out of the auditorium mm. as you know yeah <laughs> it's yeah. an uplifting show oh it's so <laughs> uplifting but just the foyer there as well um jason it's it, it's like walking into a fairy world you know yeah. it's the the decor is just so uniquely different isn't it mm. The creativity, the Regent was uh, built in 1929, and that was a really a booming time in, um, uh, in the economy, and there was a lot of investment into uh, theatre particularly, and, and the Regent was, uh, was um, there was a race between the developers to build uh, Melbourne's grandest theatre and the Regent and the Forum. Um, <laughs> Um, the entrepreneurs behind Frank Thring at the Regent oh, right. yeah, and yeah. Um, were pushing to open Melbourne's grandest theatre and the Forum actually won by three hey, months. <laughs> oh, the bastards. I wonder <laughs> who owns that. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, but the wonderful thing also about uh, the Regent is uh, un underground is this amazing ballroom. The Plaza Ballroom, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, again, it, uh, it sort of highlights that beautiful uh, foyer of, of the theatre upstairs. But it, it's so special to go down there to a, an event, isn't mm. it? Spanish colonial is mm. the sort of that, uh, I guess, a Californian influence yeah. which came in. But the Plaza Ballroom, it was the theatre was originally built with the intent that the Plaza would be the ballroom and the Regent would be the theatre as it is today. But in 19, I think it was March, I think March 1929, the jazz singer the first talking film All right. opened at the Athenaeum. Yep. And it was such a sensation uh, that they stopped the construction of the ballroom and they uh, retrofitted the plaza into a uh, another theatre. So it became the Plaza Theatre. So it never ah, actually opened as the ballroom. Right. Back in 1929, it became the Plaza Theatre. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, then, then we go around onto Flinders Street, and it's a spectacular building uh, right on the corner there of Russell Street. I'm um, talking about the Forum, the Forum, that bastard, that big, yeah, that was yeah. the first first theatre. Um, again, really interesting because it's not a theatre for the musical theatre or theatre itself. It's more a venue, isn't it, for music? Yeah, now it was originally uh, envisaged, again, not dissimilar to the region, a grand auditorium for Melburnians to come out, um, you know, on the weekends mm. primarily and to be entertained. Uh, it was a big, I think, 3,400 seat auditorium. Um, and ultimately, uh, although they were envisaged, both the region and the forum as theatres, because film after the, um, yep. the in invention of, se of talking cinema or uh, cinema took off, so the Forum never actually uh, had theatrical productions. Right. It, it was the beginning of it was Union Theatres, which then became Greater Union, as oh, we know today. Oh, I do remember that, yeah. yeah. And the Regent was the beginning of Hoyts. Yep. So the Regent was where Hoyts essentially started, yep. and the Forum uh, in Melbourne, the Capitol in Sydney, um, and the Civic in Auckland was the beginning of um, Greater Union. Yeah. But when, when you're in the, the forum, I, I love going to see a band there and, and I've seen some, so many interesting bands, obvious ones, but then some really left of centre, which is great. Yeah. Uh, but the, the ceiling above the stage, you know, like it, it's like a fairyland. Um, it's a sky with all little stars. Yeah. And then all these <laughs> Roman and Grecian statues, you know, like being silhouetted. It's... It's bizarre in bizarre. a way, isn't it? But oh. beautiful. Yeah. It just shows how much the theatres are really part of the art and part of the occasion and, um, uh, you know, when you're attending an event. Uh, the, the forum, as is the Capitol and the um, civic um, uh, atmospheric theatres, and the atmospheric theatres were the inspiration of one uh, incredibly creative uh, I think Austrian who ah. migrated to the uh, to America yeah and he uh, created in America too there's a, a number of atmospheric theaters and it was I just can't recall remember the um, entrepreneur who then I think it was Eberson was the architect who uh, had been very successful in America and contracted with him to to build the Australian mm. uh, theaters so he was Somebody who took that, uh, is it Neuschwanstein, the, um, those Munich 
uh, or um, Bavarian castles, which Disneyland or Disney was ultimately. Oh, right. Yeah. And he yeah. sort of had that mindset yeah. and then took it to Hollywood yeah. and yeah. come up with this off the wall. And supposedly those, the statuary in the forum are actually casts, believe it or not, of the statues of antiquity from the Louvre. So um, something you could do back in the 1920s, but you can't do now. Yeah, no. <laughs> so he owned um, molds, which he then replicated around the world. Yeah. Uh, there, must, there must be so much history, well there is, not must be, there is, that you, you would be discovering little bits and pieces of the theatre's history all the time, mm. wouldn't you? Yeah, well, my mum is, um, that's where uh, Elaine, uh, my mother, has taken a deep dive and she's really archived so much of the... Brilliant. And so it all sits up in the uh, attic of the uh, Princess Theatre and yeah. there's, uh, you know, there's so much information from, you know, actresses and, and performers of the day to Federici's obituary from the Argus. And, yeah, um, yeah. And also to now somewhat morbidly uh, the ashes of some different uh, theatrical luminaries. Oh wow, <laughs> yeah. fantastic. Yeah. What, what's going to happen to it, Jason? Are you going to hand it over to museum or? Uh, I think the, I think, well really when mum started there was really, you know, she worked with Frank Van Stratton whom is perhaps the most eminent theatre historian in the country mm. and, and she's got a fabulous collection but I think Ultimately, it's probably about preservation and then digitization in terms mm. of how it's um, yeah. um, made available. And, and how wonderful to th you know that you've kept it in the family with her doing that. Yeah, mum well. mum uh, loves it, and she is um, you know it's almost become a lifelong passion and study. Yeah. So she's collected so much because so much of that history for the hundreds of years had just been sort of, as I said, there was a period sort of from when modernism and then brutalism, those periods of time in the 70s and early 80s where, you know, everything old was considered to be completely um, passe and yeah, yeah. so out of fashion. And pulled down. And pulled down yeah. and that, you know, that was, you know, not only buildings, mm. but, um, but it was also too just, you know, the memorabilia, if mm. you like. Mm. and. We've got such a rich history in Melbourne. Yeah. Oh, a theatre, and yeah, you know, and you're creating it again, helping to to drive it with um, all these theatres. Um, I've I've seen you at um, opening nights, and and your your kids are often there, um, talking about your mother, and and uh, is there any of them that she's sort of grooming to take control of all of that? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. I don't. I, we're very careful that um, there's no expectation or sense. I work with my sister, uh, Kaylee, who's um, our CFO within the business. So we work very closely and we have done, you know, for all intents and purposes, our lifetime. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'm not, not sure about the boys. <laughs> I hope they behave themselves. When <laughs> well, well, one of them was messing around a little bit and I kicked the chair Good and on he you. got the arm. And I saw him at an interval and I said, you know why I did that, didn't you? And he went, yes. What was he doing? I, I know, he was just <laughs> leaning over, you know, oh, like, okay. and, you know, like, you know, how you don't supposed to move backwards and forwards, <laughs> but, but it was uh, it's fine. Hey, he, he's a 12 year old or something. Uh, now, we're going to the baby of the group now, uh, the comedy theatre. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's a beautiful theatre, but it's so different, isn't it? Because mm. the others are so grand. And this one, you step off the street and you, and you, you literally push through the foyer. Mm. Um, it's very different, isn't it? Yeah, they are. They all have very unique personalities. I'm glad you didn't ask which is my favourite because I think, you know, like, you know, children, they, ah, they all have such okay. unique personalities but are all very different. I might ask that last question. No, well, I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm teasing. I, I, I'm teasing. I, I, because the comedy, you know, might look in some ways like the uh, the poorer cousin. It's not the the, the grandest theatre, mm. um, but it's such a beautifully intimate uh, performance space. And originally, it was built by J. C. Williamson That's right. as as a drama theatre. Yep. And you know, being the two levels and uh, a thousand seats, very close to stage, mm. so it has mm. a a relationship between audience and performer unlike any other theatre really in the country. Yeah, um, yeah. So, uh, and that's, again, the technology of theatres has, has not changed. Um, that's what makes the theatres arguably more valuable, mm. like musical instruments, you know, they value with age mm. because the, the science behind um, 
audience and stage uh, really hasn't progressed mm. in you know the previous 100, 150 years. Yeah. So the, the auditoriums are beautiful. Yeah. Uh, now I'm going to talk about, um, you know, we could talk about the theatres all, all, all day because I love architecture anyway. But you know, like you're not just you know, have you just don't have your theatres and you know like productions come. You get heavily involved along the way, don't you? You actually you know like get involved with um, uh, co-producing uh, some of the, the the pieces that have uh, been in your theatres. Uh, that that's very such a, a smart and but also a really good thing for you to do. What what was where where did that come from? Uh, uh, a necessity, <laughs> yeah, the mother of all invention. Yeah, uh, I, I think we're perhaps at a different point today, uh, certainly than we were, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, where there wasn't. Um, um, we'd have a hit production from time to time, and then the. Uh, I often equate it back to farming, where sometimes you would have a really good year and mm. good, and then some years would be fallow, and yeah. you know you just have to get by. So sometimes it was, um, and often it was just about creating a catalyst for things to happen. Um, particularly, you know, because Melbourne um, was still developing its, you know, into the event city that it is today, and um, so there was a, a real necessity, less. Um, necessary now because you know the shows and the productions that we've got to really all often you know completely financed before they arrive so yeah yeah our role is but we we our company is is much more extensive than just uh bricks and mortar so to speak mm. and beautiful buildings um it's really about um you know we in ticketing and marketing and um and uh, all the ancillary services, the back of house and front of house, and um, the majority of the personnel that working in the productions were all engaged by us. Mm. But you you invest in in productions like um, there was um, the the musical of um, Ladies in Black. Have I got the oh, right name? Yeah, Ladies yeah. in Black. Yeah, yeah. Which I, I, I saw uh, originally. Um, I, I can't quite. Whether or not it was in Brisbane or um, mm. uh, you oh no, came on it? radio to talk about this. Yeah, That's was, why I remember. Yeah, it. Well, yeah, well done. I think it actually might have played a short season at the Arts Centre, but I just thought it was oh. the most um, incredible Australian story. Um, really um, well told and 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 entertaining and just a beautiful Aust uh, musical, but in an Australian voice. So we were keen to make sure that had a uh, a longer life and. Um, yes, we were involved with that one, and so th I think that actually Simon Phillips and um, and um, uh, that guy from Crowded House. Oh, uh, uh, Tim Finn. T Tim Finn, yeah, and Tim uh, the, their new productions um, opening at the uh, MTC. Yes, it week. is. Mm. Yes, uh, same creative team and. But hold on, you've swept this under the carpet a little bit. It's so good that you you took the punt and got involved as a producer in that that play. Yeah, well, it's a, uh, yeah. There's lots of little. Uh, yes, I mean, yes. It's part of the 360 degree. Um, um, and we you know we've been involved with lots of other productions, and you know, Jersey Boys. Um, you know, that was uh, a one that we, you know, which ultimately was a, a very successful production too, mm. and produced by Rodney Rigby here, and um, and um, Noises Off, and lots and lots of different um, mm. shows, but. Our, our role is always um, behind the curtain, if you like. Yeah, okay. Not, that's but I, I can remember at um, when uh, Moulin Rouge finally opened, because it uh, didn't open when it's supposed to have opened because of the pandemic, and then it obviously had a shorter run. That's why it's coming back again next year. Uh, but the, the excitement that, that night when it opened from you... Oh. You know, like, oh, it's a, you know, the, and you stood up there and it was the long yeah. journey <laughs> yeah. and tell us about that. Yeah, relief was it? I mean, for, for you as much and for everybody, I think collectively, you know, in our, you know, broader entertainment, live entertainment industry, be it music or musicals or theatre, um, you know, for such a long period of time, there was just this unending hiatus. Um, so to be able to 
you know, lift the curtain um, to be able to have, you know, the actors and musicians back in the theatre performing to a, a, um, an audience that were thrilled to be there it was mm. exhilarating. Um, you were there on the opening night of Moulin, it was exhilarating, mm. wasn't it? Oh, just oh my God. Well, as I said, just walking in on that set alone. Yeah. Oh my God. But then it got better and better as the show went on. You just go, don't stop. Yeah. And you're like, just <laughs> no. don't stop. I'll sit here and you're like, for yeah. two days and watch yeah. this. Yeah. That's why you think, you're right. Originally, the season was much longer and it ended up, um, it was originally going to open in May of uh, 21, mm. but it wasn't until November that we were able to open. And so November, December, January, February, and then, you know, when it sold, when it closed, we'd sold the last ticket 10 weeks before the final performance was how much it was in demand. Mm. So even if it had have played its full season, uh, we would have been doing everything within our power to get it back for another run because it's one of yeah. those shows that um, deserves to have a yeah. really long run. Well, I know people who have already gone out and bought tickets for when it comes back. August 23. August <laughs> yeah. 23. And, I may, and I, when I hear it and they go, oh, I just thought so I'm going to go out and buy the tickets. Yeah. You know, like, so I don't forget to buy them or leave it to the last minute and you know, like, I've yeah. got them. Yeah. yeah. So so that's, and I was thinking, you know, where do you go after Moulin Rouge? But we were so, and we've, it's in the theatre at the moment, Cinderella, which is, you know, because I was saying Moulin Rouge is not 10 out of 10, it's kind of 12 out of 10, it just mm. pushes. And mm. then to go back to a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical, um, which was originally written in 1957 for, I didn't realise, but for television. Yes, um, yes. And played to an audience of 100 million people in Whoa. 1957. But I remember just sitting down um, and seeing Cinderella for the first time and it was just a beautiful mu a musical in the traditional sense with a, an orchestra in the pit mm. and a lovely night in the theatre. Mm. So mm. it was a nice reset after the yeah. extravaganza that is Moulin Rouge. So um, here you are, you're like, you've got all these productions that have just come, come award are here right this very moment. How long down the track are you aware of? You know, like you would know so, many, so much stuff that we don't know that you've got something coming in two years time. Obviously, don't tell it. Tell us because you probably can't. Um, yeah. And yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, like that must be exciting in itself as well. Knowing that you know, like the, the Harry Potter that mm. you would have known how oh, you would have probably known uh, two years in advance, wouldn't you? Yeah, maybe two years. Harry Harry Potter had a relatively quick trajectory. Oh, was it? Yeah, oh, okay. it, I mean, it opened in London and um, well, it was announced in London. They put six months of uh, six months of uh, tickets they opened up for sale sold out basically in 24 hours and everyone thought I wonder how this show's going to go and then when it opened the reviews were so outstanding mm. they put another six months on sale and basically sold out in a minute mm. and I think every theater owner and every producer the world over was clamoring to get yeah. um, to see Sonia Friedman and, Co and Colin Callender to you know pitch their um, their, their theatres and their wares and, um, and I thought when the opportunity came to meet Sonia I thought how are we going to pitch Melbourne uh, for a production that was so I mean Harry Potter is like the one well, must be one of the most valuable brands in the world and how are we mm. going to pitch mm. and I thought I think the only thing I can do is take a picture of the Princess Theatre and say I think we've got the perfect theatre for oh, you whoa. and whoa. Um, because you know like to I remember it was Cameron McIntosh's line that the first casting decision is the casting of the theatre. And I thought, and wow. sure enough, that was our in and, um, you know, Harry Potter, you know, three years down the track is still running. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to go back to the comedy theatre because, um, I, you know, like talking about knowing things in advance and, and with Harry Potter, with it being so... Um, so famous and and even before you know like you there was everyone out there pitching but then there was this little thing that came along uh, uh, about a year and a half two oh, years ago yeah. come from away yeah Just uh, who would have thunk that that would have been that and it's coming back again yeah. you know, it's that don't, don't let me take you out for a great night. We'll go and see a musical about 9-11. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, no. What? And with this town, you know, like in Canada, you know, like that we don't know anything about? Yeah. 
unbelievable, isn't it? Just, yeah. That's why, you know, theatre is, is a great risk constantly. Um, but, you know, risk is where opportunity lives. And to think, even the idea of creating a musical, um, I remember initially, you know, the newspaper reports about this little show that had started and it had, it had quite a, um, a, a life before it actually opened on Broadway. Um, because it was developed by, I think, two teachers originally. And their husband and wife. Husband and wife. I, I was at, the, the state government bought them out and they performed at the Sofitel or somewhere like yeah, that. Yeah, that's... Uh, and, you know, like, the, that story of, of yeah. they went there and spoke to the people and, and... And recorded the dialogue verbatim and then essentially wrote the music on their guitars yeah. in thinking, you know, had all the recipes to be an absolutely terrible <laughs> night out. Yeah. But it's one of the most genius works, um, isn't it? Because yeah. it takes, it really took, and, and there's just the image of 9-11, but it essentially takes this moment in time where the complete opposite um, plays out. Mm. Love, mm. compassion, mm. hospitality, and looking to a future that's not necessarily, um, mm. you know, full of so much fear as was at the time. Mm. But so the show, when it opened, it opened with practically no... Um, box office advance, practically mm. none. So the only route to actually create a success here was to actually just get people into the audience, into the um, into the auditorium, yeah. uh, into the theatre to see the performances. And it was literally over. It took about four weeks, and then after four weeks, it was essentially selling out every single night, yeah. and it sold out for uh, uh, I think it was it was it nine ten months initially. And then it closed because and it announced COVID. a return. Uh, well, yeah, we were so lucky because it literally closed one oh, week. Oh, that's right. Um, it, it extended by two weeks because it had been such a success. So it extended into March of 2020 um, by two weeks. Uh, COVID landed the second week um, of its extension. Uh, so it was still in the theatre. And because it was not a, uh, an essential work, it sat in the theatre. They'd already announced they were returning in February the following year, um, February 21, um, and uh, which was supposed to be, be the end of the tour. And subsequently, it never, ever moved. Mm. And then when we were able to reopen briefly in 2021, we mm. lifted the curtain yeah. back on the show. And the sensibility, that same moment in time where people just felt that they'd been through a, yep. a really turbulent time, it's, it's sold out again. Mm. Uh, so three, so far, uh, the production sold 320,000 tickets. Wow. Um, with another season just announced, which will probably be the last, mind you. But, um, mm. And that, that's not just the most popular show in the theatre's practically 100-year history. It's the most popular show by a factor of two. Um, wow. Incredible. So. Unbelievable. You know, like five years ago, we knew nothing about it. Nothing. Yeah, like absolutely incredible. Isn't it just, again, the power of creativity yep. to say, how yep. can you take a topic that's so sensitive mm. um, and then to layer it with, and I think the music, the, the emotion oh. that music can bring to storytelling when mm. it's done right, it's just mm. such a powerful yep. medium and, and evidenced by how many people came to see the production mm. and will hopefully come back again. They, they will, <laughs> they will. Jason, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today and congratulations on what, what you've done for Melbourne, the, your theatres and you, you know, like heading, heading it up and doing a spectacular uh, job. So congratulations and thank you for being on The Art Hunter. Thank you, David. You've been watching The Art Hunter. I'm David Hunt and we'll be back again next week.